Philippians chapter 4, verses 14 through 23. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble, and you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, 
No church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving, except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. All right. Let's start with verse 14. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. English grammar teaches us that the first sentence of a paragraph is the most important one. It's the main thought of the paragraph. Helping in trouble is what this message is about. Helping others brings surprising results. God is a very special promise for those who generously help others. Verse 15. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving, except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. This message is about relationship. Relationship between Paul and the Philippian church connected in relationship with Jesus, who is at the center. From the very beginning, Philippi was Paul's supporting church. Wherever Paul went, the congregation in Philippi supported this ministry. This happened after Paul's departure from Macedonia. It continued during his time in Thessalonica. They sent help once and again. And now, 10 or so years later, Paul, during Paul's imprisonment in Rome, they sent a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. Paul is thankful for the history of helping that the church in Philippi has shown. Philippians 1.5 describes it, because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. They were there from the very beginning. Partnering is the same word as fellowship. Others had a one-way relationship with Paul. They, were, they received only. You alone reveals that Paul loved the Philippian church because they helped when others did not. A true partnership is about a relationship that involves giving and receiving. Sometimes God puts us into unique relationships with other believers. This is what happened here. Paul, Silas, Timothy, and their team traveled to Macedonia at the moving of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit led them to Lydia, the businesswoman, the demon-possessed slave girl, and the warden of the Philippian prisoner prison initially. Out of these strange beginnings, a congregation was started. It later includes men like Epaphroditus, a courageous man with a heart to serve. This is a generous congregation. They were grateful for the changes the gospel had brought into their lives. They recognized true riches, not on hoarding and keeping things, but in the blessing of giving things away. True riches are not about owning a yacht, a nice car, a gorgeous home, because those things don't last. True riches are about those things that are eternal that lasts forever. I love it that we have unique relationships with other believers, especially from other parts of the world. Think about some of the people that we connect with, support, and pray for in 22 and 22. There's Ryan and Emmy from Japan that, was with, that were with us a couple weeks ago. There's Ruslan and his team 
in Southeast Asia, Pastor Sunday from Southeast Asia, Millicent in Kenya, Pamela in Suriname, Andre and Ludmila from Ukraine. It's awesome. We get this wonderful opportunity of giving and receiving together. And that's with God's workers all around the world. Verse 17, the blessing that comes with giving. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the truth that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. Paul adds to the thought his theology of giving and receiving by highlighting the spiritual and eternal significance of living a generous life. Paul starts by saying not. He's being very careful as to what he says and what he doesn't say. After talking about the privilege and responsibility of giving, he says, not that I seek the gift. Paul wants him to know that his joy isn't due to the fact that they're giving him a gift. He's not pressing the importance of giving because he wants to get rich. That's not his motive. I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. That's what Paul is after. He wants the Philippians to bear fruit. He wants them to profit spiritually. Fruit that increases to your credit. Or another, as another version says, I seek the profit that accrues to your account. This is part of God's upside-down kingdom, and it's important to understand. Mark 8, 35, who are, whoever would lose his life, for whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake in the Gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? Mark 8 shows us that we need to give our life to Jesus and for the sake of the gospel. If you want to save your life, you have to give it away. And you give it to the right person and for the right motivation. This principle was demonstrated by Jesus as we saw in chapter 2 of Philippians. Jesus did not count equality with God as a thing to be grasped. He humbled himself, took the form of a servant, and died on the cross for our salvation. Jesus gave his life for our sake and in obedience to the Father. And what was the result? 2 verse 9, Therefore God highly exalted him and gave him a name above every name. So at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and Every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. God loved the generosity that Christ showed to us. He blessed us. He blessed that generosity by exalting Jesus above every other person and every other power. And in the end, that brought great glory to God. The same principle applies here. If we give what we own, what is precious to us, for the sake of Jesus, for the sake of the gospel, we will receive a profit that accrues to our account. The motive needs to be right. We don't give so that we can selfishly get. That's not what we're talking about. This is not a get-rich scheme for our own personal gain. This is about gain giving because we love Jesus. Jesus, in his grace, has given us so much we give in a response to Jesus giving us everything. It's his love for us first. Then out of our love for him, we give away so that others can be blessed. Matthew in chapter 10 of his gospel talks about motive and he talks about reward. Verse 42, and whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water because he is a disciple, Truly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. The motive here is obedience, because he is a disciple. A disciple does what the master teaches. Jesus gave out of love, expecting nothing in return. The Father blessed 
that obedience, that humility, and gave him the whole world. We need to give out of love, expecting nothing in return. In the end, we will by no means lose our reward. We give as a response to the marvelous grace God has shown us. We give because Jesus is a giver. He gave us his he gave his life for us. So the mature believer knows that giving is no burden. It's pure joy. It's a glad act of worship. Every day when you give our offerings, or however often you do it, we should say, this is only by your grace. Receive this as a joyful offering of worship to you who made me your own. I have received full payment and more. We've been taught previously in this chapter to trust God for everything. 4 verse 6 says, do not be anxious in anything, but in everything let your request be made known to God. We trust God to meet our needs. That was Paul's expression. I have received full payment and more. God has taken care of me. I have everything that I need and more. But many times, God's provision is through the hands of believers. God uses his people to meet the needs of others around him. This is the second part of our mission statement, love people. We love people in many different ways. One way is to be generous to them with our time, our resources, and our finances. A fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. The first mention of God smelling the aroma of a burnt offering is when Noah offered a burnt offering of clean animals and birds after leaving the ark. It was a pleasing aroma to God. Genesis 8:21. What makes a sacrifice a pleasing aroma is not the smell, but what the smell represents. Noah was grateful and expressed it by giving something back to God. A fragrant offering is also mentioned in Ephesians 5 2. Paul cause, calls Christ's death on the cross a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. Paul uses similar wording here in 4 verse 18. A fragrant offering, a sacrifice, acceptable and pleasing to God. The Philippians were grateful for what God had gave them, given them, and they gave generously for the work of the gospel being done by Paul in that area. Generosity to the work of God is a beautiful thing. It has a fragrance when it's done with right motives for his kingdom and for his glory. We're telling God, thank you for blessing us. Generosity involves faith. We give generously because we believe God will continue to supply all of our needs even after we've given sacrificially and generously to those around us. We believe this reflects the nature and character of God's kingdom. People see this generosity and bring praise and glory to God. This pleases God and gives him great joy. In this passage, we actually see two generous offerings, two sacrifices given to Paul. The first offering was the gift itself, that which resulted in Paul saying, I am well supplied. The second offering was the sacrifice of the gift bearer himself. I'm reminded of the story of Sundar Singh. Just like Sundar, Epaphroditus was willing to travel for the sake of the gospel. Epaphroditus was willing to take that long journey from Philippi to Rome, a journey over a thousand kilometers, taking anywhere from six, to, six weeks to three months to deliver the gift for Paul. Risking his life and actually almost dying was what, was what was lacking in their service to Paul. God holds beautiful the sacrifice of his servants, being willing to risk their lives 
for him. Verse 19, my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. This is a great verse, often quoted. It's very interesting to think of the context. We've just been talking about generosity, giving and receiving with an attitude of love for Jesus. The motivation comes from our relationship with Jesus. He was generous to us. We want to be generous to those around us. Paul talks about the fragrant offering the Philippians gave, then comes with a statement, God will supply every need. Does that mean that we need to be generous before God? We need to be generous before God is generous to us. Not in the least. That sounds like legalism. We could never live up to that standard. God has always been generous to us. Even when we still hated, hated him, he still had his best in mind for us. Romans 5, 8 says, But God showed his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I think the context is saying that if we are generous out of a true and loving heart, without regard for ourselves, but only seeking the good of others, God will bless that generosity by being even more generous to us. The Philippians were generous to Paul, but God is even more generous. He will supply their every need according to his riches and glory. The Philippians did a wonderful thing, but God will outbless any action or giving that we might offer him. He will always give us more than we could ever give to him. Generosity is its own reward. Let me explain it this way. A stingy person is one that holds tightly to the things that he has, and there's no room for more. But a generous person has an open hand, and now, of course, there's much more room to receive what God has for him. And that was a great story that Lauren told me, a little lesson there. Thank you, Lauren. God will supply. In the end, good things always originate from God. He might use various agents done in unique and creative ways. But all that we have comes from God. Paul was thankful to the Philippians for their generosity, but could see that it originated from the generous hand of God. And the Philippians dared not boast about their generosity because the motive and the capacity to give came to them by the grace of God. We can be thankful that God uses us to bless others, but we can never take the credit ourselves. Notice it doesn't say that he will give you everything we want. That would destroy us. God is so much wiser than us, he knows the difference between what is good for us and what eventually will hurt us. I only have to look at my grandchildren, or any child that matter, as they're growing up. What do children want? Well, candy, pop, chocolate bars, homework, not on your life. No way. If we let our children do everything they wanted, they would become sick, they wouldn't learn how to work, and they would become self-centered tyrants. I see that child in me. All the self-centered, self-focused tendencies of children I recognize in me. I want this, and I really want that. But God is wiser. He knows what's best for us. He knows we need a healthy balance in our lives. Whether we're talking about work and play, good things and difficulties, discipline and relaxation, he brings this beautiful balance to our lives. According to his riches in glory. When we talk about riches, in this context, we're talking about riches in glory. Ephesians 1, verses 3 to 14, can help us understand what these riches in glory are. Verse 3 says that God blessed us in Christ with 
every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. That's a lot of blessing. Verse 5 says that we've been adopted as sons and daughters through Christ Jesus. Verse 7 says we have redemption through the blood of Jesus, the forgiveness of our sins. Verse 9 says he will make known to us the mystery of his will. We are united with him, and we have obtained an eternal inheritance. That's a lot of blessings. So there are spiritual blessings, but there are many other kinds of blessings as well. This is part of God's generosity to us. He gives us more than we can ask or think. There's an interesting contrast when we compare verses 18 and 19. We might state it this way if we were to paraphrase Paul. You met my need, and God is going to meet your need. You met one need that I have, but God will meet all your needs. You gave out of your poverty, but God will supply your needs out of his riches in glory. I get excited contemplating those things. Generosity brings glory to God. Verse 20, to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Generosity starts from God and is directed towards us. When we, res when we respond with generosity back towards God, it's shown in generosity to those around us. A cup of cold water given to the thirsty is like we're giving it to Jesus, but the benefits go to the one that receives the cup of cold water. When we give with generous hearts and give to those around us, it brings great glory to God. God's name, his character, are often defined by how we live our lives. If we are stingy and frugal, it's clear we're living for ourselves, and that doesn't reflect God. When we are generous and open-handed, it shows we are living for God and for others. Greet every saint. Paul doesn't want to exclude anyone. He wanted each of them to know the affection and the love that he had for them. Paul includes greetings from those who are with him. This includes those of Caesar's household. How is it that the prisoner of Caesar can witness and bring into kingdom those of Caesar's household? These are God's mysterious ways. Think about it. Paul was invading the very household of his enemy with the love and power of God's word. Caesar was trying to get rid of the influence of Paul and would eventually execute him. But Paul was returning that animosity with the love of Jesus. In the process, the household of Caesar was being infiltrated with the gospel of Jesus. That gives new meaning to that word, sweet revenge. You can hate me all I want. I will love you and bring the gospel to you and your family. No enemy is safe from the loving, redeeming hands and words of God. No country, no city, no person can stand against God, safe from his influence. We have seen how God has penetrated the country in Southeast Asia where we work. It's a communist country where no missionaries are allowed. And yet, God has had that blanket of Satan's darkness slowly taken away and replaced it with the emerging blue skies of God's kingdom. Grace. I've said this before. Grace, the most beautiful word in the English language. We get what we don't deserve. We get the generosity of God directed to us, his riches in glory. We're talking about the throne of God in the kingdom of heaven, the place of healing and wholeness and completeness. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. In, eter in eternity, there will be no more striving, no more stress, no more tension, no more broken relationships. What will it be like to live in complete forgiveness, joy, and peace? 
that future looks awesome. It's also what we can experience now. Breathless anticipation of God's goodness expressed into our lives right now, right here. Not just in the future, but right now. That's Paul's prayer for the Philippians. That's Paul's prayer for us. And that's my prayer for you. We started with the story of Sundar Singh. He was a man with a generous heart. He's willing to risk his life to help a fallen traveler. His reward was his life. We don't have all the details of, his, of how that rescue worked, whether it was the extra exertion of helping, but it helped both men to stay a little warmer, and in rescuing this man, Sundar saved his own life. There is a story of greater heroism than this. Jesus also came to help the fallen traveler. He also had a generous heart and carried the fallen person to safety. But Jesus knew he wouldn't save his own life in helping that fallen person. The very point of his rescue was his own death. When Sundar went down to help the fallen traveler, he had hope of his own rescue. When Jesus went down to help the fallen traveler, he knew his own death was sealed. He could only help the fallen person if he allowed himself to be killed. He knew the cost. He knew the pain. He knew the suffering it would cause him. He knew it meant separation from his heavenly father. What amazing love. What incredible generosity. And he did it with joy. And this is the point of the message this morning. God can be your help in time of trouble. Just as God has generously given to you, we can generously give back to God. And he will give his riches in glory. And he will give us eternal life. Amen. So in closing, I'd like to uh, actually pray uh, Philippians 1, verses 1 to 9. Let's pray. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent and shall be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. Amen.